Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to another one of my shows, William Wallace for America. As you know, I am William Wallace, but with me today is a candidate. As you know, I love my candidates. And with me today is Lee Murphy, who's running for Congress in Delaware. Lee, thank you so much for coming on there. I really appreciate William, it. William, it's a, a pleasure to be here with you in New Orleans. And uh, I just want to say how, hello to your listening audience. Well, you know, this is, this is kind of going to be a unique interview and video today because, you know, we're in New Orleans. You came down here to New Orleans, even though you're running in Delaware, but you've got an event tonight that you're going to. But also, you used to live here, didn't you? Hey, look, New Orleans, I, I, I love this place. And uh, the people here are just amazing people. You know, I, I moved here in 2005. And uh, little did I know that was going to be a very historic year in the, the history of New Orleans. And uh, uh, before Katrina, after Katrina, uh, I really saw what the city was made of. And these people, uh, the culture here, it, it's, it's truly amazing. And, and I, I, I love this place. And... Uh, I guess I should call it my second home. Your second home, huh? <laughs> uh, but you know, your real home called you back. Delaware, right? <laughs> your your De real home called you back. Delaware, uh, the first state, um, called me back. And uh, I have three wonderful children, uh, four grandchildren. And uh, there's love New Orleans, but the, the grandkids uh, kind of are number one. And... Uh, I'm back in my state, and I want to. I'm running for Congress in Delaware. Uh, we need to make Delaware uh, uh, great again. Uh, we need to. Del uh, Delaware has a lot of room to uh, improve, and we're not doing really well right now. Well, I, I like the fact that not only um, you know does Delaware call you home, and your home called you home, but I like the fact that you're, you're still doing some traveling. I met you in Orlando. Uh, a, a, you know, a few weeks ago, you're down here in New Orleans doing some event. So, you know, as a congressman, you know, you've got to focus on your state, which is what you're doing by when you moved back there many years ago. But as a, an American, you got to realize that you have to stay in touch with all of America, which you're kind of doing by traveling a little bit to kind of meet some people and get some fresh ideas. You know, Congress uh, represents, I'll represent Delaware in the, in the House of Representatives, but uh, it's a national office, and uh, how I vote affects you, and it will affect all of America, and it will affect uh, my second home in New Orleans here. So it's very much a national office. I'll be voting on is issues that uh, everybody uh, in America will be concerned about. I love it. Well, I've got your site pulled up, and we're going we're gonna to refer to the site a little bit. But uh, but I also want to talk a little bit about what where you, where you were, what you did before you ran for office. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? What your sure what your, what your experiences were before you ran for office? Because I do like people to get the chance to know you also. Yeah, I think I have a, a unique background. Uh, certainly not like anybody else. You know, I, I graduated from college. Uh, I started a teaching career. I was a health and physical education teacher. I coached in the Catholic Diocese of Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, after a couple of years of teaching and uh, making about $5,800 a year, <laughs> well, my family expanded from two to three. So I had to find another career path. And my grandfather worked on the railroad uh, for 51 years. He was a train conductor for the old Pennsylvania Railroad. And uh, I always loved trains growing up. So I got a job on the railroad, became a, a train conductor, a locomotive engineer, uh, ran trains in the Northeast Corridor between New York City and Washington, D.C. I got a chance to meet a lot of uh, people, but uh, worked 35 years on the railroad. Uh, it was a career I, I really enjoyed, really loved. And uh, since that time, I retired 10 years, 10 years ago and uh, started an acting career. And I've done film, TV, uh, and it's been a very rewarding career that's taken me all over the country and all over the world. Uh, so train conductor, teacher, train conductor, actor, uh, always involved in my community, church, uh, community, civic association president, uh, swim club, all the things everybody does with, when they have yeah. kids. And uh, so, uh, I love the, I, I love the seeing the unique skill set that people bring to the table. You know, when they run for office, because you you, you oftentimes want to know what people do and. And I don't think that the, especially in today's world, I don't think that the traditional, 
you know, go become a lawyer, doctor, engineer, and that makes you the only qualified person to run things when you have, you know, or, you know, you've been the you know, a, you know, multimillionaire entrepreneur. I think it's regular people, you know, and regular and, 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 and those uh, careers that make regular people the, you know, the most common in our country, you know, the most prevalent in our country are the ones who can represent, I think, our country in some of the best ways. And that's why I like your skill set. Well, let's, let's be honest. Uh, you know, there's not many uh, train conductors slash actors slash <laughs> teachers in Congress, okay? And what people back home call me, and uh, I've become known as a blue-collar conservative. Yeah. yeah I worked on the railroad. I, you, you put in the words what I was trying to say in too many words. <laughs> yeah, I'm that guy that, uh, just like everybody else out there, you know, supporting a family, uh, doing what you have to do to make ends meet, uh, putting kids through college. You know, we, we've all been there, done that. And, uh, you know, I'm not a millionaire. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm just a hardworking guy and uh, that uh, has really had a good life. And I've enjoyed my life and I've been blessed in so many ways. And now, quite frankly, it's time to, I think I've always given back, but now uh, in the home stretch, it's time to really give back, and I look at my grandkids, and I see them, and their beautiful faces, and I want them to have, I really do want them to have the opportunities in the life that, that we've had. We've had those opportunities, and I really want them to, to have that, and it's all on the line now. It's all at stake for them, Right. and, and we're, the ones, we're the ones that have to fight for that, and, uh, and, and that's, that's why I'm running, and uh, uh, I want uh, those my grandkids and all the grandkids out there to just grow up in a united, beautiful, prosperous America. I love hearing that. Uh, but what I, and what impresses me a little bit that I want to point out, sometimes you have to point out the obvious, is that you had this great career, you know, 35 years of the railroad. You, had, you were a teacher before that, you know, you, uh, you know and then acting was just kind of, was kind of probably your fun you know, second career if in retirement and speaking of retirement, instead of retiring and doing your fun career, you're kind of getting back into the game here. You're running for office, you know, at a time when you could be having fun, doing something that, that that's a, that's more of a labor of love and raising kids, you know, or not, you probably raise your kids, but helping raise your grandkids and enjoying those sunset years, so to speak, raising grandchildren, you're throwing yourself back in the mix here. Well, uh, William, I'm a healthy guy. Uh, you know, I go to the gym every day. I work out. Um, uh, I have more energy now than I ever have. And uh, retirement is not in my vocabulary, quite frankly. You know, I love to play golf, but I'm not going to play golf every day. Yeah. <laughs> and what's at stake? Uh, you know, what's at stake uh, really, you know, in my lifetime, you know, I've seen things that weren't right. Mm -hmm. and, and we all step up, whether it's in our neighborhood or our community, we step up, we try to change those things. And right now, and everybody knows what's going on in our country right now, uh, it, it's not a time to be a spectator. And I like what Tom Brady just said. You know, he retired, you know? Yeah. He, says, he says, I'm not ready to be a spectator. I'm not ready to sit in the stands. And I'll tell you, Lee Murphy is not ready to sit in the stands. And... Uh, I, I, I'm out there, and hey, look, I enjoy the process. I meet so many wonderful people, and I'm really speaking for people that don't have that voice. I have the voice, okay, and I can speak for people that, that really don't have that voice but care about this country, have the same values that I have, and it, I feel a responsibility to carry that forward, to, to do, to do right. that. What are some of your, your, you said values. What are some of, your most, what are some of the values that are most important to you? Well, you know, I don't wear my religion on my sleeve, but look, this country was founded on Christian values, okay? And uh, I'm very much a Christian, and uh, I like to uh, lead by example. In other words, uh, you know, my Christian values, uh, rather than talking about them, mm -hmm. I want to act and conduct myself and lead my life uh, in a way that reflects those Christian values, and I think I have most all of my life. So those values need to be brought back, certainly to Washington. They need to be brought back mainstream. Let's face it, those values are under attack. 
uh, just the, the moral fiber of our country has been under attack, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of what religion. Uh, so that, that, I love my country, but what I'm doing is really based on those values that have been ingrained in me. That, that are under attack, as you say. Yeah. You know, I've got your, your website up, which I want to invite some people to go visit, which is gomurf.com, G-O-M-U-R-P-H.com. We've got it up in, in, front, in front of us. Um, you know, so anybody who's listening to the podcast version of this, um, they're going to be able to go to gomurf.com and see you. Uh, of course, if they've started on video, the video platform, they got a chance to see you in person. But we've got your site pulled up, and I'd love to talk about some of the things that you've got on your site um, you know, we don't have to necessarily name who you're running against. We don't want to give that person any more publicity unless you want to. Um, but we've got some things that we're going to talk about here. And you also have a list, too, I think you said earlier um, that, that you want to make sure you had with you to talk about. So anybody who's listening or watching, you're about to learn a whole lot, not just about your values, a little bit in more detail, but things that you stand on. Uh, looks like on top on your list is uh, number one on your list, actually, is law, order, and safety. Well, I'm running against a woman in, in Delaware that uh, has voted with Nancy Pelosi 100% of the time. In wow. The last cycle. One, 100% of the time. And just to give some perspective on my opponent, uh, she headed up the committee that selected the vice president. She thought Kamala Harris was the best choice. In fact, she made a statement saying that she could assume the presidency on day one and do a great job. And now we, that was we, your, the congressman that you're yes, running against that said, made that comment. Made that comment. Now we all know what Kamala Harris is, and my, my congressman back home, she lacks the judgment if she thinks this woman could be a great president. So, uh, you know, I'm running against somebody that's. I like that you're not attacking the person; you're attacking her judgment. Her judgment, and let's face it, uh, anyone that says Kamala Harris would be a great president doesn't have very good judgment, and yeah. we know that. That's been proven out. We, 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 we've seen the gaffes. Yeah. But, and also, when we go through this list, I want you to point out the things that we talked about off camera that you feel that we, that we as Americans can unite on. Uh, I think that's really important to point out, too, because you know, oftentimes we talk about Republican versus Democrat. We talk about conservative values. We talk about things that unite us. And I think what's important to point out is, as we go through this list, the things that unite us. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether you're a, a Republican or a Democrat. It, it's about good ideas and solutions that not only solve the problems in where you're running in Delaware, but across our country. And I want to you know, put, set that stage because as we go through the list, I'd like for you to point that out and connect those dots for people. Sure. We want, we obviously. Law and order. We, yeah. we want to unite the country. At the top of the list, law and order and safety. It's something that we've taken for granted for years, uh, until the last couple of years. Suddenly, we don't have law and order or safety. We're not, we're not safe in our communities any longer. Uh, the cry from the left is defund the police. Look, I think Republicans, Democrats, independents want law and order. They want to be able to go out and walk their dog in their neighborhood without fear of being held up or shot or whatever. Right. I think it, it's an issue that... Uh, you know, the left is taken, uh, and uh, it's misguided. And we're seeing the results of that right now. A crime is up in every major city. Right here in New Orleans, we talk about uh, the horrible crime through the roof. I live close to Philadelphia, New York City. I, I would not recommend traveling there at all because of the crime situation. Mm -hmm. So we have a situation in our country where uh, people, their safety is at stake. And we need to fund the police. Well, so I was going to ask you, and that, that might be the answer, but if you have another answer, let me know. What can you do as a congressman to promote law and order in your state? Well, the bills that have been introduced into uh, Congress, uh, if you read the fine print, they really handicap the police. It does everything but say we don't want the police. And I, I've read these bills that my current congresswoman supports. We need to fully fund the police. We need to get the best people to defend our communities and give them the tools that they need. We need, to, we need to once again make that a respected position. We don't need to take away their immunity, okay? 
from prosecution mm -hmm. for giving somebody a traffic ticket, okay? We need to, and many of these bills want to take away their immunity. Who, we, who are we going to get to become a policeman if, if, they, if these people have to, policemen have to look over their shoulders every time they do something? We have to support the police. Are the police perfect? Okay, well, not in any line of work. You know, I'm, you're bringing a thought to mind, and sorry to interrupt your thought, but something that, that I think will, will kind of, to, that you've kind of helped me out here to think. We look at our communities today, and they're a lot more dangerous than they used to be. Now, qualified immunity back in the day, you know, many years ago, was something that police officers didn't need that often. I, it just is my opinion, because we had safer neighborhoods, safer parts of town, safer communities, because police were respected, and so there was less violence against police officers, there was less hatred towards police officers. In the last, I'd say, 10, 20 years, We've seen more crime. We've seen more narratives being put out by a, I would think that would be more to the left. You know, the narrative that we've seen more narratives attacking police and making police the bad guys. And as a result, I think now you're seeing more violence against police. So now it's almost like police are being, are having a harder time policing. And that's why we're seeing more and more crimes or more, of the bad police because of the scenarios where qualified community, qualified immunity, I believe tied to policies that make our communities safer will, will give people less need for qualified immunity than if we just let our communities go willy nilly like they're doing right now. Is that a long way of saying that qualified immunity is a good thing tied with economic policies that create safer neighborhoods? Well, I think, it, I think you tied it all together there, William, uh, and I agree. Uh, I, look, we touched on, you touched on the economic part. Let's face it, our, our cities are economically depressed, okay? No jobs. Right, exactly, no right. No jobs, crime, drugs. Uh, uh, economics plays a big part in, in why certain things are happening in our, mostly in our cities today, in depressed areas of our country. So, no, uh, policies connected with funding, um, yes, uh, but we, we have to, the, the policemen in our communities, we, we have to not demonize them like the left is doing. Exactly. They're, they're demonizing, demonizing. Yeah, that's why I said that the, 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 it's, the, it's that demonization of police tied with bad policies that are creating crime in our areas where that, you know, the police are having a harder time policing, whereas if we reinforce policies that create safer communities, more opportunities, Police will need, won't be under attack as much and won't need as much qualified immunity, but it should still be in place to help keep policing uh, in force. Yeah, I agree with that, William, but overall, it, it really goes back to the breakdown in our communities. I, oh, mean, I agree. I mean, it starts, let's face it, it starts with the family, and, and then it, it goes downhill from there. We, we don't have those. When I grew up, we, you know, we, we had a... a strong families we we had parents we had we had boy scouts we had cub scouts we had little league baseball we had we had all these groups and basically it was just an umbrella group of people that really helped us uh grow up in a way where we respected people we respected a law and order. right exactly that pledge of allegiance exist. prayer you know yeah. uh community Policing, good policing, it's all tied together. And, and it's really, uh, I don't want to get into weeds, but it's really a societal problem here. And, uh, but the, we, we have to have law and order. I mean, we, we, as a civil society, we cannot exist without punishing people that break the law. They need to be prosecuted, and they need to be punished. It is a deterrent. Right. It is a deterrent. But if police can't enforce the law, and then when they do, criminals go to court, and we have district attorneys and attorney generals that say, ah, that's, uh, it's okay, they can go back on the street. Well, that, that, that's a recipe for a disaster, and it's happening right now. I believe that the part of the reason why it's happening right now amongst, well, uh, 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 there's a lot of reasons why it's happening right now, but one of the big things is I think that the narratives that they're, that they're creating 
to hurt the police is being tied with the narratives that they're saying that criminals have a right. <laughs> they're trying to give criminals more rights than they are law-abiding citizens. And they're doing it through, I said, different narratives that are creating these, these policies that are making it harder to police and harder for our communities to write because if you do this against this criminal, you're the bad guy. Yeah. yeah. So, you're, you're, yeah. yeah you're, we're punishing victims and we're, we're, we're uh, making criminals the, the heroes almost. Yeah. In some, in some, in some places and, we have. And look, this is not a racial thing like the left would like you to think. It's, a, it's another way that they are trying to divide us, okay? Everybody, uh, everybody that I meet in the city of Wilmington back home or in the affluent suburbs, they want law and order. Right. And in fact, they need it more in those poorer sections of town than they do in the suburbs. You're making a great point. And, and, and the left would like to, again, issue after issue, they, they want to divide, divide us. And... It's, it's law and order, if you took a poll, I'm sure the vast majority of people in this country would want policemen, respected policemen, be able to enforce the law to protect neighborhoods. So, yeah, we, we have to, this is, this is a subject that America really is behind and, and not against. And the narrative is being pushed by a small group of people in Congress in local communities, mayors, district attorneys, people that have a political agenda, they're pu they're pushing it, and uh, to and it's harmful for the population. And I'm glad you brought when you when you brought up racial, it made it made me remember something I wanted to bring up, and thank you for that, which is you know bad police, uh, well bad policies, you know will create neighborhoods that make it harder to police, and when those communities are out of control, it hurts. The poor, it hurts. Uh, it it hurts uh, minorities. It hurts the poor minorities the most. While at the same time, they create the the left creates narratives that says, "Hey, it's actually their fault over there." Instead of policing and creating policies that make create safety and better neighborhoods for everybody, because better policies, better policing helps minorities out astronomically. It helps those their communities the most mm -hmm. and helps bring their communities up mm -hmm. it sounds to me like that's kind of your objective is that you want to create policy help create policies on a national level that help your communities and lift up everybody exactly hey let, let's be honest you know people play politics uh, with this issue okay when i go to congress look we have a problem what do we need to do in this community to make it better Okay, what do we need? Let's bring the communities together, the police together. I think they already know what they need. But the leaders, the political leaders of these communities, they, they don't want to see that happen. They don't want to see somebody come in and actually address the problem and bring people together. Because when you have solutions, there's not a need for more policies or more spending <laughs> exactly. or more government. When there's solutions, you actually need less government and less policies and less money spent. We saw that in the uh, previous administration. We were, as a country, we were headed in that direction, exactly, where uh, we had a problem solver in the White House and uh, someone that uh, solved problems. And that's, that's what we need in Congress. That's what we need in the mayor's office. That's what we need in city council. We need people uh, that are going to say, okay, here's the problem. What do we need to do? Let's take care of it. So are you yeah. saying don't, people need to stop voting for the D's and the R's and vote for the problem solvers, the P's and the R's, the, pro the, the, problem, the P's and the S's, the problem solvers? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I was trying to come up with a new little thing. You're saying, you're saying <laughs> don't, don't vote party. You're saying vote for the problem-solving people. Yeah, we, you know, it's more about problem-solving than it is about party right now. Yeah, the, the, the people that have solutions. Look, we can call each other bad names and, and try to divide – that's easy. I mean, we can do that all day long. Right. But that doesn't help the people. It doesn't help the country. I mean, look at the situation that we're in right now. I mean, um, we're divided uh, more than ever. Uh, problems aren't being solved. Congress is a, a joke, basically, right mm -hmm. now. Uh, the president, uh, uh, we'll talk about 
Joe Biden later, but he is anything but a problem solver. Uh, he's a problem creator, as we have seen in just a little over So you don't want to bring as much party to D.C. as you want to bring problem solving to D.C. Yeah. yeah I love I hearing that. Yeah, yeah. I, at this stage in my life, this is not going to be a lifetime career for me. Yeah, you just, uh, you, want to, you just want to solve some problems for children, grandchildren, and the rest of our country. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, this is, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't, people say, oh, once you get to Washington, you'll be caught up in everything. And I say, look, you know, I, you know I've had a good life. I, I have a pension, a blue collar guy. You know, right. I'm not going to, I, I'm going to, I'm not going there for any other reason. To other than to solve problems, make this country. You're not going there place. to make a career out of this. You're going to solve problems. I love that's that. That's right. That's right. You know, I want to give a, before we go to the next topic here on, on your on your site. I want to bring up something interesting that I that I thought that you know, a unique piece of information that you gave me on the way over here, and that people, people don't realize how many Congress people are in Delaware. Well, we have a unique state. It's a small state, Delaware. Um, and uh, we have a population of about 975,000 people. And we only have one U.S. representative, just one. And the U.S. representative in Delaware represents more people than any other representative in Congress currently. Maybe someday we'll have two. But we have two U.S. senators and we have one U.S. congressman. So that's an interesting tidbit in Delaware, the congressperson almost has more power than the senators. I, I mean, not really. I understand the, the way it works, but, you know, there's one congressman but two senators. Just one, and uh, maybe in 2030 we might have two. But uh, so in Delaware, they really focus on who's going to represent them in Washington, and, or they should, because they only have one. Right. And uh, uh, it's... Uh, yeah, it's it's unique, and as I said, we we uh, when I represent Delaware, I'll be representing more people than any other congressman in the House. You've got a vibrant economy on uh, next on your site. What what do you want to say about that? Well, uh, a vibrant economy. Uh, I mean, it's, it, you know, it sounds like common sense, but oftentimes <laughs> people have better ideas that you want to share. Yeah, let let's let's in Delaware. Delaware used to be the uh, three things. We had chicken farms. And we still do. We had banks, credit card banks, and we had a gigantic uh, chemical industry, DuPont Corporation, uh, Hercules, other, other chemical companies. Delaware once had a vibrant economy. Uh, we had two car manufacturers. We had uh, Chrysler. We had GM. They employed thousands of people. Hmm. Uh, all gone. All gone away. And The credit card industry, too? Well, it's, it's hanging on. It's 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 still there, but the chemical companies are pretty much gone, and uh, just the car companies are, are gone, and this all took place under Democrat leadership in our state, and it could have been prevented, but uh, their attitude was they're in power, and basically they don't care. Well, we have to bring that economy back to Delaware. I mean, we have a great location. Right. right in the Northeast Corridor. Exactly. We're small. We should be able to operate a lot easier than New York or Pennsylvania. It's almost like a special forces operation a, for, for a state. You're small and you could be really nimble. We, we, <laughs> we could be, and it was once upon a time. I've seen it. I witnessed it, but no longer under Democrat rule. And it's really sad. We've gone from an uh, economy that was really vibrant, uh, great schools, uh, great communities, and and now we have more WalMarts than anything else. And um, not knocking Walmart, but we need an economy better than than that. We need a, a better economy. Walmart can be a part. You just have to have more of the business and industry that Delaware used to have used to, to have. make it that vibrant, special place to live. Yeah, yeah, and we 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 can do that. And let's talk about jobs. Uh, you know, overseas, we know, look, I'll just take the uh, computer chips that are used in everything from washing machines to cars. Where are they made? China. Overseas, China. Yeah. Okay. Our life-saving drugs, the ingredients, they're made China. Okay. Let's bring these jobs back to the USA. And I will work to bring 
And I'm just using those two as an example because they really uh, are, are hurting the United States right now that we don't make computer chips here. And we need life-saving pharmaceutical drugs need to be made in the United States. So I'll work every avenue to bring those kind of quality jobs back to Delaware, back to the United States. Uh, we need to be, as, we've, as we're learning here, uh, we need to uh, uh, protect, uh, protect ourselves economically. The things that we need for defense, our security, need to be made in the United States. I love hearing that. Uh, what about the uh, opioid drug e epidemic? I mean, this, we have open borders. As we speak, there are illegals, people coming across the border, breaking our laws as we speak. We have no idea who they are. There's been over 2 million in just one year. We have no, no idea who they are, what their background is. Okay, we don't know if they've been tested for COVID. Right. <laughs> we don't know if they're, we don't know what countries they're from. They could be terrorists, uh, terrorists, uh, child traffickers, uh, mean, nasty people. We've learned that, okay? The influx of drugs, and I've talked to a lot of police chiefs, it, it's, it's at an all-time high right now. And let's face it, this fentanyl and these things that are coming, this poison, that's coming across the border exactly. right now. They're it's being made in China. Right. It's <laughs> made in China. But it's poisoning. It's a cancer on our society, especially our young people. It's, it, it's, it is just dragging down our society. We've lost over 100,000 people last year to drug addiction, po over overdoses. Mm -hmm. I like to use the word poison because it's poison. Okay? It really is. It, it's poison. And... We have an open border, and the president and my our current congressman, my opponent in Delaware, they're okay. They're okay with this policy. They're okay with open borders and the evil that's coming in, the drugs. They're okay with that. It's unacceptable. You know, I, rem I remember when it used to be, and you would hear this from, you know, not only the Democrats, but you'd hear it from people that were that were felt themselves be more caring individuals. Um, because they would, you would always hear, well, we have to let people in our country because they're looking for a better life. And for people who are caring individuals, I understand that. I'm a caring individual also. I care about people having better lives. But in today's times, recent times, we're hearing more and more that it's less people coming here for a better life, and it's more people coming here to bring drugs, human trafficking, uh, the harvesting of body parts. There's all kinds of things that are happening back and forth across the border that it, or we're now more aware of. You know, we're now more aware that it's more illegal, you know, nefarious activities than it is, you know, the positive activity of people just coming here for a better life. Mm -hmm. And I think with that information out there, there's more and more proof that we need to do something about that, our border, instead of just saying, well, let's leave it open for the small percentage of people that are looking for a better life. And I think that's what's happening. You're exactly right. And uh, let's face it, the, the left, Democrats, um, they want the open border. They see voters. They see voters. They see voters. They see staying in power forever and ever. And that primarily is their reason for this. Uh, influx of let, just letting these people come into the country. Look, this is the United States of America. I, like you, I care about all people. I care about what's happening in Ukraine. I want to help those people too. But look, look, when your house is on fire, okay, you, 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 you want to put it out, right? You want, you want to take care of it. Exactly. Our house is on fire right now, okay? Right. Okay, it's up to us who we let into this country. We don't have to let anybody into this country. It's our country, mm -hmm. our sovereign country, okay? We, we can say, okay, we'll close our borders, and no one's coming into our country. It's up to us. I care about Americans first, okay? I care about the people out there, the, the businesses out there that can't get employees right now. I care about the, uh, the, the students that have had to wear masks for two years that God knows where their educational level is right now. I, we, we have to get our house in order here. Exactly. Okay? Uh, well, it's, the rest of the world... I'm sorry, they have to take care of themselves. 
and we can certainly lend a helping hand. Well, what I find hand. what I find interesting is, is that you know while we're trying to help other people that, that are coming into our country illegally, we're printing money to help Americans, and and we can, that's a whole other topic, the national debt. You know, and I and I completely disagree with the printing of all the extra money. You know, for our own country, we should be living more responsibly. That, that's a whole other, I guess, a whole other conversation, because in the printing of all this extra money just to take care of ourselves, we're running up a national debt that is going to be the burden of our great grandchildren, and at the same time, they're bringing in, all, letting all, all these illegal aliens come in here and trying to take care of them, which is cause us to have to print even more money. In right now and in the future to take care of them, it's just a recipe for disaster. And that's kind of what I like to bring up, that we have to stop. Uh, look, you and I sitting here right now, we, I think I think we have a, each individual in the United States, we have like $230,000, uh, uh, each one of us in America right now, has uh, we break down the uh, debt. We, we have 230, we're responsible for $230,000 each, each. Based, on, based on the debt. Exactly. This is unsustainable, okay? It's unsustainable. And the printing of money, we saw this during COVID. When the, when the Democrats on the left, you know, wanted to, quote, take care of everybody, okay? Maybe in the beginning it was necessary, but we saw one CARES Act after another CARES Act, another CARES Act, and now, uh, where did that money go? Right. I mean, and exactly. now- Exactly. Now they're contemplating some another uh, so-called uh, act to help. There, there is some. They're they're trying to do a three hundred dollar gas credit or or give everybody a check for three hundred dollars in gas. It, it's it, it's like I said, we could talk about this forever. You know, on the printing of money and the programs. You one one thing one thing right now, and I've advocated this. Let's uh, temporarily suspend the national gas tax. It's about twenty five cents, twenty six cents, whatever. Why don't we just temporarily just suspend the gas tax nationally? And states, if states suspended their gas tax, it could send it could save people right now probably up to fifty cents a gallon on gas. Uh, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it, it, it's a lot for somebody that's on a fixed income. For it's sure. a lot better. It's a lot better than taking oil out of our strategic reserves to use to try to drop the price of, of gas temporarily when the strategic reserves that they emptied out only solved the problem, I think, for like one day. Okay. You know, but your idea to suspend the national sales tax would help all Americans, okay. not just the people of Delaware, but it would help all Americans for a longer period of time. And it, it's easy to, to do. And, and I, I don't, quite frankly, I don't understand why it hasn't been done already. And uh, it, it should be done. And... Uh, you know, to use our oil reserves. And let's let's go back. Who set that up? That was President Trump that set that up. He set up those oil reserves for emergency situations. Mm -hmm. He wasn't thinking about, you know, the price of oil. Well, he but, had them filled up. Yeah, he had them filled yeah, up. Yeah, he had for, them filled up. For, for real emergencies, uh, you know. Well, we, let's talk more about, uh, you know, with Delaware. I'm mm -hmm. going to focus more on, yeah. your, on your stuff with Delaware. We, and, I, and I want to point out, a minute ago, you said... How you you made the you told us about how great the economy used to be in Delaware, and then the Delaware Democrat Party kind of took over, and you now pointing out how bad Delaware is doing. Mm -hmm. Isn't it the old adage of if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you're getting? And now there's an opportunity to look at things that you are important to you for people to decide whether they want to vote for something different. Mm -hmm. And, and, and take a shot that there's going to be a better future for Delaware or if they want to keep voting for what they've been voting for and keep getting what they're getting. And so I want to point out, as we've been going down your list of things, I'd also like to talk about health care competition. Uh, that, that's that's on the on your site, on gomurf.com. Mm -hmm. Well, look, w yeah, people right now are, are, are looking for an alternative. They know what's not working. They know that... In Delaware, they know their current con congresswoman is invisible. They know she aligns herself with Nancy Pelosi. Uh, they know the state of the economy in Delaware is not good. Uh, they, they know the state of our country is not good right now. So they are looking for people uh, that are an alternative. 
like a problem solver. A problem solver. Not a D a, or an a R, but a problem solver. A problem solver. <laughs> okay. Yes. They're looking for a problem solver. It's not enough, as we said earlier, just to call out other people and say, you're bad, bad, bad. Uh, you know, it's all right to point out their mistakes and what they're not doing, but in turn, we, we need to offer solutions to the problems. You mentioned health care. Uh, of course, that, that, that's something that really needs to be addressed. Quite frankly, the United States Congress, the Republicans, have not really addressed that head on. We've, we've seen the disasters that have come from the Democrats, Obamacare, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they want uh, Medicaid for all, programs that aren't, aren't really affordable. Uh, so health care, I, mean, I don't want to get into the weeds right now, but we have to increase competition uh, among states. We have to uh, cut out certain people in the health care process that uh, are, are, are not really needed that escalate the cost of, of drugs, mm -hmm. uh, pharmacy managers. Uh, and in Delaware, we only have really one health care provider. Uh, that health care provider, that hospital, it, there's no competition. We have one of the highest health care uh, costs per patient in that hospital in the nation. Lack of competition. Uh, not good. We have to introduce competition in the healthcare market, uh, I think, on just a, every level. There has to be more so, tran transparency. So not just Delaware, but nationwide? Yes. Okay. Co uh, competition. I believe uh, the free market has those solutions. I don't believe in government-run plans. Uh, we know they don't usually work, and uh, we need... Uh, more of a free market approach to healthcare to drive down costs for everybody. What about uh, looks like what about school choice or, or quality educations? Well, these are subjects we could talk a lot about. And you know, in Delaware, look, number one, I am for school choice. I am for school vouchers. I am for anything that gives parents the best opportunity to get the best education for their kids. And in Delaware, a small state, we have 19 school districts. Unbelievable. Administrators make more money than the governor, okay? The quality of education in Delaware, quite frankly, in the public school uh, sector, it's hit or miss. Most bad, most mediocre, mediocre, very few good schools, okay? A lot of kids, the poorer kids, are trapped in schools that they, there's no way out. They have to go to these schools. So I believe in school choice, uh, vouchers. I be, believe that uh, parents should have the opportunity to take, take that money and send their kids to the best public schools possible. It's, it's, it's not good. And choice, choice, choice. Again, we're talking about competition. Right. Competition. Well, competition is key. And, and not only... Do a life that you're bringing. You you brought up again, uh, uh, um, poorer communities. You know when poorer communities can go out and do and have school choice and go to better performing communities for schooling, and then they can see the policies that are working in those other communities on why they're doing better. Mm -hmm. Then they can bring them back and start emulating those in their communities. Mm -hmm. Better policies, school choice, competition, including with healthcare. It just raises that that those standards. It raises everything for everybody. And when you're raising it up for everybody, the poorest people are the ones who benefit the most. Yes. And I like the fact that you keep bringing that up and going back to that. I think you know, it's really important. The, the school situation is it, it's absolutely critical in Delaware. It's critical everywhere. And while we're on the school situation, let's just talk about critical race theory for a minute. Okay. The, the left... And the Democrats uh, are more cons more concerned with with introducing when our schools are failing. They're more concerned with introducing uh, again a, a, a poison, an indoctrination based on not fact but fiction, to to divide our children from kindergarten through twelve. I think it's a form of child abuse. It's criminal. Let's teach history for God's sakes. We'll teach, teach it all, okay? But not indoctrinate kids to make 
certain kids feel like they're the victims and other kids to feel like they're bad. And you know, when you combine critical race theory with millions of people coming across the border from other countries who have other ideas about America, that, that have other ideas from the countries they came from, and you combine that with re-educating people in our own country and teaching them, you know, you create a society that not only doesn't love America, but people who don't love themselves and are more susceptible to bad policies that will depress communities and keep people down in such a way that government will always be needed and allowed to get bigger and control people in poor or in worse situations than they could be if we educate people properly with a competitive way that brings everybody up to higher standards. But talking about that also in the critical race theory to point out that you know critical race theory basically tells one group of people you're bad and you can't do anything about it and teaches another group of people that that you're always going to be a victim and there's nothing that can be done because you'll always be a victim because these people have it in their blood to always be bad. And it creates a, a division where people will never be united and people who are divided are the ones who get controlled and, again, allows for bigger government. Well, William, you, you just nailed it. Uh, you nailed the left's uh, philosophy here. Mm -hmm. And people see that right now. This is a philosophy that they want to divide and they want to conquer. They want to divide us, they want to conquer uh, on every issue. Uh, the critical race theory and, and every issue they want to suppress people. They want to keep people down. They want to retain power. They want, they want you and I to hate each other for whatever reason. They, they want to, and, and, and it, when it reaches our children's level, that, that, it, that, that's pretty bad. That's pretty horrible. And I won't stand for that. Look, I'll, defund, I'll vote to defund the Department of Education in Washington. It's pretty much worthless anyway. And uh, look, the, the, the power should go back to parents. We've seen this in Virginia. It should go back to local communities and, and parents in those communities. Make the decisions there. What's, what's happening for, in their communities. What's, what's best for their kids. Not some bureaucrat in Washington that's uh, you know, pushing some kind of agenda and holding up funds based on what you do in your, your school district. That, mm. that, you know, it's blackmail, I think. Right. And uh, extortion. So yeah, let's return it to the local level and we're fighting a tough battle here because we know the teachers' unions are, 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 are against everything we've just been talking about. Right. Uh, they're, they're basically an arm of the Democrat Party, as we've seen, or, uh, and the radical left. Unacceptable. Um, unacceptable. And, and I've been a union member all my life. The teachers' union is, is, is uh, uh, it's just, as I said, it, it, they have an agenda. And you know what? Sometimes it's a political it's, agenda. And it's not always the people, the, uh, the members of the unions no. that are bad. It's sometimes just a select few people that operate it. I personally am not necessarily against unions. If somebody wants to be a member of a union, I personally am against the control that that the some of these bodies have over the people. So sometimes people want to be a member of a union to have their bargaining power magnified by the union. But oftentimes the unions are misguided because the wrong people are are basically guiding them or or leading them. So that's unions can be a whole other topic of discussion. But you know something that's very important to me in our country is the Second Amendment. I mean, I really am a strong believer in it. And 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 the misconception is that people who believe in the Second Amendment, you know, want the Second Amendment in case of that, you know, they have to overthrow overthrow the government or. And that's not it at all for me. For me, the Second Amendment is about being able to protect myself, and it's more of um, of a stand or a, or a a symbol. The Second Amendment for me is more of a symbol of freedom and liberty for individual rights than it is about anything else. What is the Second Amendment for you? Well, the Second Amendment uh, protects the First Amendment, doesn't it? Okay. And let's face it. Our freedom of speech is uh, under attack right now, and it, we can we can talk about social media. We can talk about the the news media, TV, television, radio. We can talk about that. 
uh, newspapers. Uh, certainly, uh, freedom of speech is under attack right now. So the Second Amendment, I always say I support the Second Amendment as written. I, I support the Constitution. And I'll take an oath when I'm sworn in to support the Constitution. The Second Amendment, and again here, the, the left, the Democrats, you know. We're going to define that in a second for our listeners, too, I think. But go ahead. Yeah, they, they want to, again, divide. They want to go after, somebody asked me the other day, what do you think about the gun problem in this country? And I knew where they were coming from. Right. I said, yeah, we have a terrible gun problem. We have way too many people uh, in control of illegal guns in our streets of our cities, and and um, we need to do something about that illegal gun problem. Now, gun owners and the hundreds and hundreds of gun owners that I know are law-abiding American citizens, and they have those weapons to protect themselves, to protect their families. Uh, we kind of need it more now than ever before, right. quite frankly, based on what's happening in our country. Uh, and for uh, sporting, hunting, uh, whatever, uh, whatever. You know, people that own guns, as I said, are law-abiding citizens. And the people that I've met, uh, and, and they secure their arms and uh, they protect their arms, and it's their constitutional right. Uh, and for the left to, to go after such a upstanding part of our society, and I'll mm -hmm. say that because I know many, 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 many uh, members that, uh, uh, friends of mine that are hunters and, and target shooters, uh, it's, they're, they're, they're barking up the wrong tree. Bad guys over here. It, it, Go after the it, bad guys, but they, they won't do that. They won't and you know what's interesting, like to your, to your point, you know, is that, and I always have to say this, that law-abiding gun owners pray constantly to never have to use their weapon. Yeah. Whereas the owners of the, or the, the, the bad guys, we'll just say, with the illegal guns, you know, they can't wait for the opportunity to use their guns. And if we as a society got together and elected better people that created policies that created better opportunities, created more safety, created more competition, better schools, there would be less gun violence and guns would be less vilified by every anyone because crime stats would go down drastically just on gun on gun violence so uh, i'm glad that you support the second amendment you know, well, you know what you just said william it, it, let's let's face it here everything the democrats or the radical left what we've been talking about our freedoms okay exactly our freedoms they want to just squeeze us and squeeze us until we don't have those freedoms any longer. You know, freedom of speech, Second Amendment, uh, school choice. Uh, they they want to squeeze freedom out of this country. And to me, that is unacceptable. You know, is, this election is crucial. Uh, we, you know, again, we, we discussed, it's not about Democrat, Republicans, about whether we continue to have our country as we know it and enjoy the freedom that we have. You know, we, we see a, a country far away in Ukraine right now, and they are fighting for their freedom. And we're seeing a president and his people, you know, outmanned, outgunned, fighting a superior army, fighting for their freedom. That's inspirational. Exactly. And that should send a message to people in this country that this freedom, yeah, it's written down in the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Okay, that paper is not worth, uh, those words aren't worth the paper it's written on unless we defend it. Exactly. And we're not having a country invade us yet, but we are certainly under, t under attack on a lot of levels. So that freedom, people, I hope people are, are, are seeing how precious that is, and what people are doing to protect that freedom. And uh, we, we fought for that freedom almost 250 years ago. People gave up everything to, to ensure that uh, we are where we are here today. And uh, make no mistake, uh, this is a crucial election. It's, it's our fight right now. 
you know, you have uh, something else that you, you brought up a minute ago, which is, you know, freedom, you know, also protects our value of life. And, you know, how do you feel about the value of life when it comes to freedom? Uh, are you talking about uh, pro-life? Or, pro-life uh, uh, or all, all forms of valuing all forms of life. Yeah. Well, look, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a pro-life candidate. I, I mean, I, I think I was pro-life uh, before I even knew what pro-life was, exactly. before we had this division in our society. Uh, yeah, I believe in the sanctity uh, of life. Uh, unlike my current congresswoman uh, who believes in you know, late-term abortion, ab uh, abortion at birth. Uh, she even voted against a bill that would uh, protect uh, life-saving measures for uh, babies born from botched abortions. Uh, that really crosses the line for me. I mean, uh, in, in Delaware right now, there's a bill that's being promoted to assisted suicide. Basically, you can call it quits at the end of your life if, if you want to. Mm -hmm. And the state government will make that okay, legal. These things are just borderline, they're, they're, that's, that's just crazy. Mm -hmm. When do you, you want the government to say, okay, you can end your life uh, today? Uh, do you want the government involved in that process? Well, the problem I, is, and, and you, I, you bring up something unique you know, here, um, you know, where it crosses that line of freedom and liberty, you know, and, and value of life. That and I always have to tell people that sometimes what people want to defend their right to choose, or they want to defend something that might not might not be as um, commonplace or as uh, as appreciated, I guess, as a, of a freedom. Uh, getting a little off track there, but certainly getting back on track to what I'm, my thought process. When you give government the control over freedoms, when you give the government and you and you and you let the government make rules, and they make more and more rules which govern freedom. Pretty soon, the government is going to control everybody's freedom. So you might agree with one freedom, but you don't agree with another freedom. So you say, okay, the freedom that I, I don't agree with, or I do agree with, however the case may work, I'm going to let the government control that freedom. The more we do that, you know, in the end game, we won't have any freedoms. And and so when you protect the value of life. And you protect everybody's freedoms, you know. You actually shrink the size of government or the need for government, which expands liberty in the end for everybody. I think you, you just pretty much uh, summed it up there, William. I think uh, you're exactly right. Uh, government, let's. I mean, I want. I, you know, I guess the the libertarian side of me. I want less government, less government, less government, less government. I want government out of my life. I want government out of people's lives. I believe that people can make the choices in their lives to be successful, to, to raise their families. I believe businesses know best uh, what they need to do. You know, we just saw it in COVID. Exactly. I thought businesses were shut down, just boom, government. I thought business people, surely they knew what was best in a difficult situation. It wasn't government's place to shut them down, not at all. So we, yeah, the, the, we can't pick and choose. This country was based on freedom, freedom, okay? And those, that's under attack right now. And um, look, um, we're, we're headed towards that socialistic, Marxist, communistic way of life. And if people want that, I'm certainly not their candidate. If they want to go down that road, uh, I'll see you later. So you say if people want freedom, liberty, competition, less government, you're the guy? I'm the guy. Well, I've got a couple questions to ask you before we wrap up here for our listeners. Um, you know, is uh, one, you know, when you, you know, when you're elected – to Congress, what would be the first thing or the first couple of things that you would want to do as a congressman, not only for the state of Delaware, but for our country? What would be the first couple of things that are hot on your list? Well, number one, we got to close the southern border. we got to secure the southern border like it was uh, two years ago. We have to finish the wall. Okay, We have to support our law enforcement, our border patrol. We have to staff them sufficiently. 
And again, we have to work with the Mexican government to secure that border 100%. I think that is absolutely crucial. Number two, we have to, we have to take care of this supply chain crisis. Let's face it, uh, we need to make goods in this country. We need to bring back manufacturing, as I mentioned earlier, to this country. It's absolutely crucial that, that we make things in this country that are essential to our national security. The third thing is, and this could be num number one, actually, we have to have a return to energy independence. When this president shut down the Keystone Pipeline, that was a disaster. Not only thousands of people were thrown out of work, our energy independence went by the boards. We were energy independent for the first time in 45 years. Okay, that was lower gas prices. Uh, it affects everything in our society, our energy production. And that all went away. And what happened? We're begging OPEC for oil. We're then recently going to Venezuela and Iran, our enemies, for asking them for oil, unacceptable. We have to use the resources we have in this country. Whatever is in the ground, we need to use it. Oil, gas, coal, and let's look at nuclear energy too. We, why not, why not? The Green New Deal is fantasy, okay? And that's what this administration, the radical left, they have these plans where you know, everybody has to buy a $60,000 a year car, okay? Not gonna happen. Not going to happen. So close the border. Let's make things in this country. Let's, enter, let's get our co economy back on track. Become energy independent once again. And let's have our military be the strongest military in the world. We do not need a woke military. And, and let's just work together. Let's work on uniting this country, bringing it back together. Uh, we have a divider in the White House. We have a Congress that is... I, I well, speak, <laughs> speaking of Congress and speaking of uniting, you know, I want to talk about, you know, Delaware right now has a different party control. Um, you know, you're of a different party, um, but you're, we've talked about your, your problem-solving abilities, uh, your experience, and, and your willingness and determination to be a problem-solver. What will be something that you do this is your second to last question. What will be the what will be the one so the big thing that you will do to unite the people of Delaware? You know, how will you come in as a different party and unite the people of Delaware? Well, I've I've always been a uniter, whether it's coaching or in my community or in my church. I've always had the ability to reach across lines, whatever they may be to bring people to some kind of common ground. Okay, I never was one to push an agenda, but to, to come to some common ground. And again, as we talked about, to solve the problem at hand. Okay, whatever that may be. And I will work with, we have a Democrat governor in Delaware. We have a Democrat speaker of the house. We have, it, look, these people, I, I, I'll work with them. Yeah, I'll, I'll reach out to them. Right. If they don't want to work with me, that's a different story. Right. Exactly. But, but, um, and people know that about me back home. So uh, you're going to work just as hard with people of a different party as you are with your own party in helping improve the state of Delaware. I'm going to have to because that's the current state of affairs in Delaware right now, and by showing that ability to work with other people to make the state better. Um, I mean, that's what it's all, all that's about. That's what it's going to take. And if they don't want to work with me, well, that's a, like I said, that's another story. But You'll still work hard for the state of Delaware, question mark? I'm going to represent Delaware. It's not currently being represented in Congress. It's, it really isn't. You know, with somebody that votes with Nancy Pelosi 100% of the time. You is know, not representing the people no, of Delaware. That's representing California. That's not representing Delaware. And, and, uh, and I'm going to represent Delaware first. Uh and, and, and foremost, uh, when I'm in when I'm in Congress, love that. My last question: I like to ask everybody. Uh, my regular listeners know this. You know, I've actually used to be two questions. I kind of combined into one. You know, is you know what makes America the best country in the world, and what unites us as Americans. Sometimes that's one and the same. But if you have two answers, that's great. 
So what makes America the greatest country in the world and what unites us as Americans? I like to say baseball and apple pie, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I, you know, when we grew up, I mean, you know, America was number one, number one. We were number one in everything. The strongest country, respected around the world. Uh, you know, my ancestors came from Ireland. Other people came from all over the world, wherever we came from. And we, you know, somehow, some way, it wasn't easy, but we made this country and uh, melting pot, whatever you want to and. And, and, and I know in my lifetime, we've moved ahead and on race issues, all kinds of issues. You know, it's just an amazing place, uh, unique. No other place in the world like the United States where all these people came together and formed the greatest country in the world. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Right now, we're kind of like uh, stuck in reverse. But, you know, the people out there that I meet every day, you know, you know they... They love America. They, 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 and they're willing to fight for it. Um, I, I hope that answered the question. But no, uh, absolutely, no. I, I love the spirit of it. Actually, yeah. your an, your answer was more of the spirit of our country. You know, the, the essence of, of of what has brought us together. It wasn't a specific answer. It was more about the essence of bringing people together and and the history of it. And and that in itself is something that an well, answer that I absolutely love to hear. Well, just, it's, we're in it's, New Orleans right now, and one thing I love about New Orleans is it's all kinds of people. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're, it, I was, it, exactly. I mean, the spirit of New Orleans, and it brings a tear to my eye, quite frankly. I mean, the people here are, are uh, and that's why I fell in love with the city. I mean, the spirit here, all kinds of people, all kinds of everything here, all mixed up. That's, that, that reflects America to me. Yeah. You know, it's just not one thing or one type. It's it's all these people together, and uh, it's it's just an amazing, it's amazing place here, uh, and I think America uh, is just a larger version. Yeah. It's a larger version. Yeah. Or here, here in New Orleans, we unite on food and music on a as on a national basis. We unite on freedom and liberty, oh. and uh, it's the same kind of a spirit. And I absolutely yeah. love that. And, uh, you know, I want to invite people to look more into you at GoMurf.com. And uh, is there any final words that you'd like to say, you know, to the to listeners of, our, of, the, of my podcast? Sure. Well, uh, William, it's been a pleasure to be with you. And, uh, and it's great to be back in New Orleans. It's always great to be here. And uh, when I come here, I don't want to leave. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, my website is GoMurf.com. GoMurf.com. Uh, please go to my website and learn more about me. Uh, please... Consider donating to my campaign. And this campaign, uh, United States Congress, each member represents uh, the United States, really. And uh, even though it's I'll represent Delaware, it's very much a, nat a national office. And uh, I want to represent Delaware, and I want to represent America in the United States Congress. Lee, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Everybody else, please share the video, share the podcast, tell everybody. I, like I said, it's things in these interviews that I want to do, use to bring more people together, find things that we can unite on to not only strengthen our country, but retain its greatness. Have a great day.